Welcome to DM Tools with Max McCool. On today's episode of Monsters Manifested, we're going to be covering the Behir. Personally, I've never used a Behir before. Seems like an interesting type of creature, almost draconic like a dragon type. But without further ado, let's jump right into it. The Behir covers page 25 of the Monster Manual. And before we get into the lore, there's a little blurb, a little bit of flavor text written here on the page. So I'm going to start out with that and then move forward onto the lore. I've already eaten three giant bats, six troglodytes, and a mind flayer today, but that's okay. Plenty of room in my belly for you and your friends. As said by Lud the Behir, confronting adventurers in the Lost Caverns of Zodjkanth. The serpentine Behir crawls along floors and clambers up walls to reach its prey. Its lightning breath can incinerate most creatures, even as more powerful foes are constricted in its coils and eaten alive. A Behir's monstrous form resembles a combination of centipede and crocodile. Its scaled hide ranges from ultramarine to deep blue in color, fading to pale blue on its underside. Interesting. So certainly serpentine looking, kind of draconic-ish, but I can see where they're coming from when they say it's more of like a cross between a crocodile and a centipede. It has many legs. I believe it has about eight of them, 10 of them actually, but let's move on. Cavern Predators. Behir's lair in places inaccessible to other creatures, favoring locations where would-be intruders must make a harrowing climb to reach them. Deep pits, high caves and cliff walls, and caverns reached only by narrow, twisting tunnels are prime sites for a Behir ambush. A Behir's dozen legs, oh, there you go, it's a dozen, dozen legs allow it to scramble through its lair site with ease. When not climbing, it moves even faster by folding its legs beside its body and slithering like a snake. Behirs swallow their prey whole, after which they enter a period of dormancy while they digest. While dormant, a Behir chooses a hiding place where intruders in its lair might overlook it. Okay, that's interesting. So they give you a bit of the environment of a Behir and where it would reside if you were to use something like a a lair adventure type thing where adventurers have to make their way through to dispatch of a Behir that's about to cause some havoc. But we'll get into that later on in the episode. Moving on. Foes of the dragons. In times long forgotten, giants and dragons engaged in seemingly endless war. Storm giants created the first Behirs as weapons against the dragons, and Behirs retain a natural hatred for dragon kind. A Behir never makes its lair in an area it knows to be inhabited by a dragon. If a dragon attempts to establish a lair within a few dozen miles of a Behir's lair, the Behir is compelled to kill the dragon or drive it off. Only if the dragon proves too powerful to fight does a Behir back down, seeking out a new lair site a great distance away. And that about does it for the lore of a Behir. We've got some interesting tidbits of information with this. So they reside in caverns. They are foes of the dragons. And they appear to be nearly as powerful as probably the young set of dragons. And they were created by the giants, which is an interesting little note of information. Could definitely be used in an adventure in that way. They hide in or reside in caverns, mostly, it seems like, in spots that are inaccessible to the average individual. So there's there's a lot to work off of here in terms of crafting an adventure or some encounters or scenarios involving a bet here. But let's move on to the stat block for now. The bet here is a huge monstrosity with a neutral evil alignment has an armor class of 17, which is natural armor. It has hit points that average 168 or 16 D12 plus 64. It has a movement speed of 50 feet and a climbing speed of 40 feet. The Behir has a strength of 23, a dexterity of 16, a constitution of 18, an intelligence of 7, a wisdom of 14, and a charisma of 12. Pretty strong creature at 23, jeez. The Behir's skills include Perception plus 6 and Stealth plus 7. It is immune to lightning damage. It has the senses of dark vision for a 90-foot radius and a passive perception of 16. The language that a Behir speaks is Draconic, which is pretty interesting since they're mortal foes or just foes in general of the dragons. 
The bet here is a challenge rating of 11. So for about your your mid-tier players, about halfway through the campaign, if you're going from level 1 all the way up to level 20. On to the actions. Multi-attack. The bet here makes two attacks, one with its bite and one to constrict. Bite is a melee weapon attack with a plus 10 to hit, a reach of 10 feet, and it's on one target. On a hit, it does an average of 22 or 3d10 plus 6 piercing damage. Constrict is a melee weapon attack with a plus 10 to hit, a reach of 5 feet on one large or smaller creature. On a hit, it does an average of 17 or 2d10 plus 6 bludgeoning damage plus an average of 17 or 2d10 plus 6 slashing damage. The target is grappled with an escape DC of 16 if the Behir isn't already constricting a creature and the target is restrained until this grapple ends. Lightning Breath recharges on a 5 or 6. The Behir exhales a line of lightning that is 20 feet long and 5 feet wide. Each creature in that line must make a DC 16 dexterity saving throw, taking an average of 66 or 12d10 lightning damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. Finally, Swallow. The Behir makes one bite attack against a medium or smaller target it's grappling. If the attack hits, the target is also swallowed and the grapple ends. While swallowed, the target is blinded and restrained. It has total cover against attacks and other effects outside the Behir, and it takes an average of 21 or 6d6 acid damage at the start of each of the Behir's turns. A Behir can have only one creature swallowed at a time. If the Behir takes 30 damage or more on a single turn from the swallowed creature, the Behir must succeed on a DC 14 constitution saving throw at the end of that turn or regurgitate the creature, which falls prone in a space within 10 feet of the Behir. If the Behir dies, a swallowed creature is no longer restrained and it can escape from the corpse by using 15 feet of movement, exiting prone. And that's it for the stat block of the Behir, which is pretty substantial, I would say. Behirs can apparently do quite a bit of damage and have a couple of different means of taking on and dispatching their with their foes with these abilities. What I find really, really interesting about the Behir is that the only language that it speaks is Draconic, even though it is an enemy of the dragons, or it finds dragons to be its enemy. It doesn't speak like Dwarvish or, or Giant or anything like that, even though it was created by them, which I find pretty intriguing. But it seems as though we've got something that is akin to a cross between a a dragon and a snake, effectively, like some form of like boa, like a constrictor snake or something like that. But I think we could go a lot of different directions with a creature such as the bet here. But let's move on to the adventure crafting and scenario building and stuff like that now. So with the bet here, immediately, I would see this as almost a boss type creature, like a big bad evil creature for a set of adventurers for a campaign. And by that, I mean that I would probably develop a string of adventures maybe three to five, where the players are going through a couple of other smaller tasks or jobs or quests before they make it to the Behir, but it would all be related to taking on the Behir and stopping them by whichever means. So it would be something to the effect of like the players make their way to a a city or a town and the town is suffering from some kind of issue like tremors or something like that that are occurring beneath it or out in the field the fields surrounding the city or the town outside the walls, something like that. And they're unsure of what it is that's happening, right? And with that, you can make things pretty different or interesting. You could change things up, right? You could have it where perhaps some of the livestock is going missing, like larger livestock, maybe the cows or the pigs or something like that are being consumed or are disappearing type thing. And the behir is consuming them, stealing them away from the farmers and taking the, the animals to feed Now that it's woken up and it's hungry, you could do that with even horses and stuff of that nature. Perhaps some mercenaries or adventurers before your players that were in town suddenly disappeared. But the strange thing is that is that also their horses disappeared. So a lot of the townsfolk or what have you think that it's just something to do with them making their way, right? Like, oh, they decided to leave town. So, you know, I mean, their horses aren't here. None of, you know, 
They decided to leave town in a hurry, though, because all of their stuff is still residing or is still left in the, the their rooms of the inn or something to that nature. And then you could have the captain of the guard or perhaps an interesting an interested party. Perhaps there's a merchant of some sort who deals with oddities and curios who would like the players to inspect or check out some strange place where there are some word or rumors or legends about there being this rare mystical monstrous creature that could within it have some form of value right like the scales or the horns or something to that effect you could also make it a town that has a, a local curse, a, a curse mythos type thing where it's said that this building or this city or town was built atop the site of a monstrous creature and it was built above it to ensure that the creature would never return or awake from its slumber or that if it did, the residents of the area would be compelled due to what have you to stop this creature but it's become a lot more powerful than they thought or it was something far beyond what they imagined it would be or they just thought that it was some silly myth created by ancient people long before they were around so they never paid any mind to it and now the players have to go and deal with it that's one way and you could go very straightforward with it right you could go the way of well they're cavern predators so they layer in places they seem to be ambush creatures actually so you could use the tried and true old mining cave type thing with a, a, f a broken out area or some sort of sinkhole area that has revealed the Behir's lair or that has opened up a wall and the Behir has been ambushing miners or what have you within the cave to feed itself now that it's been awoken by the explosions of black powder and the, the picking of the stone walls and stuff like that. You could do something like that where it's it's very tried and true, like the, the pathway is already there. It's kind of straightforward and typical. You could do something where the Behir perhaps has woken up in the mountainside or underground even, right? And due to its stirring, now that it has woken up after who knows how long after its hibernation, there's been like a sinkhole or a collapsing of a rock face or a cliff wall or something like that which has created this cavernous area and people are afraid to venture out. So it could just be that the players have been contracted by the city or the town or what have you to explore and just investigate the area. Now that there's been this revelation, right? There's this opening now to this area that was before unknown to have existed and they don't want to send out any of their own people. So they send out the players and the players will make their way through and go through the cavern and they can fight off you know, they can fight off all sorts of creatures, you know, all sorts of cavernous creatures, some beetle type creatures. You could use the onk egg that we discussed in the previous episode. You could use something to the effect of giant spiders or centipedes. You could use swarms in this case even. And I'm, I'm being a bit more liberal with the types of monsters and creatures you could use as the players make their way to the bet here because the bet here is already at challenge 11. I would assume that as a dungeon master, you wouldn't put your players up against a bet here until they were in and around that kind of level range, right? Level 10 to 12 type thing in, in and around there so that they could at least handle the bet here. Cause the bet here is, I think a creature that for most, I mean, unless your players are highly ingenuitive and very good at you know, kind of strategically playing and stuff like that. The bet here can cause some serious damage to a lower level party. And I don't even know that this would necessarily play out as a very deadly encounter. I think that this would probably play out as an impossible encounter unless the players decided to flee. Like that's the only way I think that they would be able to survive fighting the bet here without losing their lives. I mean, unless you were also as the DM to bring the bet here's health down to like 10 health. And it's, for some reason, an old and withered bet here, which you could do, too. You could do that as well. But as it stands, even with the average health and the amount of things that it can do and its, its multi-attacks, its constricting attack, its lightning breath, the fact that it can swallow its opponents, it's it's got a lot there working in its favor for it to be a bit of a bad time for adventurers. But anyway, back to the, the scenarios. Yeah, you could make it something very straightforward like that, right? Like a mining ca cave, like I mentioned before, or like there's just an opening and it's actually more of an expedition adventure or the intent is more of an expedition adventure but from the quest giver in the town or the city or what have you. And it's more just plot out the area, map it out, let us know what, what's in there, you know, and the players make their way through and get to the end and they're fighting this large serpentine looking creature where in which you could even have them roll some, perhaps some insight or perception check or something like that once they get to that point 
to see if they can distinguish between the Behir and a dragon, depending on the type of world that this is, or that you play in, that you've developed for your players or for your campaign. Behirs could be very rare, right? They might be a very rare type of entity that's not around very much. You could create a campaign world where the dragons fought the Behirs way, way back when, like millennia ago type thing, and they effectively won. So there are dragons flying and roaming around the world, but you don't see very much in the way of Behirs because all of the Behirs that survived went into hiding, or if they didn't, they have a small piece of the world that's their domain that the dragons kind of just don't go there or don't deal with because it's such a small number, it's kind of negligible. I mean, alternatively, you could create an adventure like that where you could have your players encounter a dragon and perhaps it's not even a a good dragon, like one of the chromatic dragons type thing. You could have it be that your players, perhaps your players are ma- have made their way into a town or a city or an area where the folk of that area are being accosted and terrorized by a dragon, right? By a red dragon or a black dragon or something to that effect. And the players are like, well, you know, what do we do here, right? Especially if you use like an adult, I can't remember the CRs for all of them right now, but I think an adult dragon is about perhaps an adult white dragon, maybe not, is about this CR. You know, you could even use an ancient one, though an ancient one I feel would have its own kind of little domain or layer hidden away from people. So perhaps an adult one that's trying to establish its stomping grounds, as it were, in the world. And in doing so, this dragon is making hell out of the lives for the people that live in the in the region so you can have the players go and and deal with the dragon and perhaps they can't fight the dragon but again because it's a dragon the dragon is intelligent and can discuss with them and stuff like that and perhaps the dragon strikes up a deal with the adventurers and well the dragon's like well if you'd like me to leave there's really no other place that i would like to go except for maybe this area over here but it's said that a bet here resides there or you know, slumbers in that area or in that region. And effectively, the dragon conscripts the adventurers to go there and deal with the Behir so that if the adventurers deal with the Behir and dispatch of it effectively and return to the dragon, the dragon can say, oh, wow, you've cleared out that area for me. I'm going to go fly over there and establish my domain there. You could even, if you use something like the more evil dragons, you could have the dragon go and effectively tell the adventurers like, hey, you go deal with this bet here. I'll leave this town and whatever, but I have to establish my dominance and strength and capabilities as a dragon. So you're going to dispatch of the bet here and deal with the bet here, but I get all the credit and I get the terrain that the bet here resided in. So I'm the being that destroyed the bet here and defeated it and outdid it. And as a reward for myself, I rest my wings upon the land it used to rule over. So that's a another w- way you could implement a Behir adventure that I think is a little bit a little bit more different from the the norm or the typical thing of the players going in and into a cave and finding the Behir and taking it out in its in its domain, right? I think that that could be a pretty interesting way of going about it by using a dragon. You could use a good dragon like and perhaps the chromatic dragon is residing in the town as a humanoid like in human form as some dragons like to do and they could just be an individual in that lives in town of some form of reputation or notoriety and they're the ones requesting the aid of the adventurers to take on the bet here and then you could have a cool reveal if you really wanted to where the players are there fighting fighting off the bet here and this individual shows up and reveals themselves to be a dragon and assists the players in taking out the bet here that could actually work really well if you had a lower level party, like your adventurers were maybe like level eight or nine, and you wanted to give them the best foot forward in terms of overcoming and defeating a large monstrous creature that's pretty dang powerful, and they get to be assisted by and fight alongside a dragon, which is always cool. So you could go about it that way. I think that could work out pretty well, actually, in terms of creating an adventure with a bet here. One, here's another one, actually. Let's, let's go in a totally different direction. A cool one, I think, would be since the bet here were created by giants, uh, storm giants specifically, actually, to be used as weapons against the dragons, you could have an adventure where your players, if they're in this region or if they're making their way to a region, and if they aren't, they are now, I suppose, (laughs) but they're making their way to a region that's ruled over by the giants. And perhaps the giants have a Behir area or an area for Behirs to reside in or an area, an ancient area where they created the first Behir, and for some reason this laboratory, as it were, or workshop, what have you type thing, 
suddenly has been activated again and a new Behir has re- revealed itself from there. Or perhaps they had a Behir who they used to use to protect their walls from the dragons and it, it slumbers perpetually now f- for it no longer has to defend the, the giant kingdom from dragon kind, right? However, for whatever reason, the Behir has awoken and has now decided to kind of run rampant, right? Now that there are no... Now that there are no dragons to defend the giants from, the Behir might have just decided to take over the kingdom of the giants. Perhaps the Behir just awoke and is hungry and is particularly indifferent to its creators or their desires or anything that they really want, right? Perhaps it it wants them to worship it. And because giants don't typically worship things outside of their usual idols, they're refusing to do it, but the Behir is slaughtering them in droves or what have you, right? And I mean, you could play this out to be pretty, you could play the Behir out to be pretty, pretty smart. I mean, their intelligence is seven, so they're not the smartest, they're not the sharpest knife in the drawer, let's say, but they have a decent wisdom and they have an average charisma. So, they're not necessarily very, very book smart, but they have a lot of sense and common sense, things to that effect. So you could play it like that, right? Where a Behir might not necessarily be considered smart or intelligent by modern standards, modern being contemporary to the time in which your players are currently adventuring, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doofuses, right? It could just be that they're not as intelligent as as the average creature is because they've been hibernating for 2,000 years, so whatever they knew is archaic and old and irrelevant to the modern information that has been acquired or is common knowledge type thing. But they're, they're quite wise, they're average in charisma, so, I mean, at a 12 charisma 14 wisdom you have a a creature that can talk and and stuff like that and interact with the players but is probably less cerebral right it's kind of still guided by its i don't want to say primal intentions or primal desires but it's guided a bit more from its from its wants and and needs it's not really it's not looking to formulate this grand scheme or plot that involves like subterfuge and and subtlety and things of that nature but it's also got enough common sense to realize if someone's trying to trap it in some sort of deal or dispatch of it in some way, shape, or form, or set up something that would leave it kind of hamstrung. I think that that's a pretty cool way of going about it, actually, with the the giants that have kind of effectively a Frankenstein's monster type scenario where the scientists have lost control of their of their creation. I think that could be a, a, an interesting way to go. However, I do like the the dragon adventure quite a lot where your players encounter and interact with a dragon of some sort. I almost feel as though one of the evil dragons would probably be more interesting and entertaining at least to watch as a dm and to see how it plays out with this evil dragon like basically contracting them or charging them with dealing with the behir that's in this other land and dispatching of it quickly and effectively so that it can then find new residents there where the where the behir once lived and it gets all the glory and it gets the land and all of that stuff and the players don't really gain necessarily renown from the general public in terms of them overcoming this huge monstrosity but they'll know what they did and they know that what they did was for the right reasons type thing as they'll save the people that the dragon is terrorizing type thing I mean, if you already have a, a dragon that's kind of shapeshifted into human form and is is helping the players out or is informing them of something or has a, a mission of some sort for them to go on in order to deal with the Behir, then that's all the better, right? And I mean, you could even, you don't have to do the reveal with the, the good dragon to help them out type thing. You could just have this individual say, hey, there's this rare monster and their scales are worth a lot. Their horns are valuable. Like they can be used, the ivory can be used to enchant certain things. Perhaps the material that the horns are made of have some inherent capability of storing or have residual magics laying within them that can be used to alleviate or assist in the enchanting of things or perhaps grinding them down into powders and dust can be used to make powerful potions or something like that you could give the behira a gland of some sort or some form of like organ or something that generates the lightning that it can produce from its breath attack stuff like that you know there's there's a lot of different avenues you can go with uh with a bet here i mean even just as a trophy a bet here is an interesting and unique monster that you could definitely bring into your adventure or into your campaign that would be i mean not only outlandish in terms of your typical monsters and stuff of, of that nature but 
it would definitely be intriguing because it's a creature that personally I've not seen used very much at all in in games. I mean, I've I've never used a a bet here in any of my games, but I just might. I mean, my players are at that level where they could pretty decently take on a bet here, so I might give it a shot and see how they they fare with it. I mean, they're level 14 now, I think, so a bet here shouldn't be too much trouble to them, but who knows how it'll go, right? I might just uh, I might just use this in my next adventure, whenever that is. <laughs> but that's about it. That's everything I've got for you guys today. Thank you very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I hope that there's something there that you guys can definitely make use of with the bet here. I know that I've already kind of got the juices pumping in my mind as to what I could do for an interesting adventure with the bet here and how they could be, how a bet here could be implemented in an adventure for players to deal with. There's a lot of ways that you could definitely go about it. I gave you guys kind of an outline for three-ish different scenarios that you could frame your adventure around. And I mean, if you're playing if you're playing a D&D campaign and your your players are at level 11 and you're giving them a CR 11 monster to go up against, chances are they're pretty well established as adventurers and you're pretty well established as a DM. So you you know how to how to set up adventures that they like type thing. So I left it a little bit more breezy and open for you guys to pick and choose what kind of scenario you like and and populate it as you would. But I think a bet here is actually a really cool creature. I think it's a very, very cool creature that you could use in an adventure as something different, something that could be mistaken for a dragon. You could even have, like I said, like you could have townsfolk and stuff say that they're cursed by some dragon or the myth says that some evil dragon will arise and and massacre the, the town or what have you. And it's not a dragon. It's a bet here. But for all intents and purposes, it appears to be a dragon, right? But anyway, once again, thank you very much for tuning in to Monsters Manifested. I appreciate it. And next week, oh, awesome. Next week is going to be a a good episode, I think. Next week, we'll be covering Beholders. But we'll see you on the next one. Have a good day, everyone.